I don't like describing things in words. I prefer to show them if possible. I, Georgi Balanchivadze, was born in St. Petersburg on January 22, 1904. My father, the Georgian composer Meliton Balanchivadze, was born in Kutaisi. He made a name for himself as a collector of Georgian folk songs. His contemporaries referred to him as a Georgian glinka. He authored Tamar Tspieri, the first Georgian opera, and numerous choral pieces and sacred chants. After the death of his first wife, my father, at the age of 36, married Maria Vasilyeva, who was much younger than he. They had three children, my elder sister Tamar, my brother Andre, who went on to become an acclaimed composer, and I. Father used to tell us that as a child, he was very open, a big fan of guests coming to their home. Balanchine, who was very reserved and shy, would hide from them, though. They were good at playing forehand pieces, and they were very proud of it, announcing to their parents that they had just learned Schubert or Beethoven. Whenever they quarreled, father, in his own words, overpowered his brother, despite being younger. He also claimed being cuter as a child, though eventually his brother grew up to be more handsome. Father used to say that his brother was not of this world. The difference is that Balanchine was loftier, while father was more of a down-to-earth person in both music and life. They lived hand-to-mouth in Petersburg, but one time Melaton unexpectedly hit the lottery jackpot winning about 200,000 Russian rubles. Of course, they breathed a sigh of relief and bought and moved into a large apartment. By that time, my parents had already chosen a profession for me. I had to pursue a military career. Mother took Tamar and me to St. Petersburg to enroll me in the Maritime Academy. Tamar was expected to try her luck with the ballet class at the Imperial School of Theatre. As it turned out, class admission at the Maritime Academy was already closed. An acquaintance at the ballet school advised my mother to let me audition along with Tomar. And behold, a miracle. I was among the selected boys. Tomar failed, though. I would see my parents on rare occasions. I felt lonely in my first year. I dedicated much time to various positions and moves, but all seemed futile. I thought I would never be able to master them. He even ran away from school several times. His aunt lived nearby in Petersburg, and that is where he would hide. Fortunately, he was made to go back to school, and his life in ballet continued. In my second school year, I experienced a breakthrough of sorts. At the age of 10, I re-evaluated my study experience. The legendary Marius Petipa had died recently. He was venerated in our school, including by me, of course. Petipa produced excellent examples of conceptualism in choreography, which later became the foundation of my work. My first time on the stage was in a Tchaikovsky ballet. It was in The Sleeping Beauty, with choreography by Marius Petipa. Tchaikovsky has been especially close to my heart since childhood, and it is more than love. He is always with me. He is like a father to me. Balanchine adored Petersburg from his childhood. The imperial school, in which he and his education were rooted, stuck in his mind. I am often asked, what is your nationality, Russian or Georgian? I sometimes think, by blood, I'm Georgian, by culture, Russian but by nationality, Petersburgian. Petersburg will always remain a great city for me. In early 1918, our family traveled to Tbilisi to visit with father, who became Minister of Culture of Independent Georgia at that time. I never saw my parents again. 
Mother decided that Georgi would stay in school, and she moved with him back to Petersburg for a while. I never realized that a revolution was around the corner. I was little. Riots broke out in Petersburg and shots were fired. The streets were no longer safe. The Imperial School was a boarding institution providing meals. When the revolution started, meals stopped, so the students were on the brink of starvation. Georgi's family was also quite needy. Then they moved to Tbilisi. Balanchine, in his memoirs, writes that they would go without food for days. In parallel, I enrolled in the Petrograd Conservatory and dedicated three years to studying music theory and taking piano lessons. The dancer's salary at the theatre was hardly enough to cover the expenses. To make ends meet, we put together a youth ballet company where I choreographed my first dances. It proved a tremendous success. We became the latest trend in town. Even though Balanchine was praised as a very talented choreographer, he was less likely to have a future of any capacity in Russia. Word has it that a decision was made against promoting him on this path. Once, the company went on tour to perform in Berlin. After arriving in Berlin, we received a telegram from Moscow requesting our return. In defiance of the request, we stayed in Europe. I was 20 at the time, daring and gritty. We traveled across Europe and performed wherever we could find an audience in summer theatres, parks, at private parties, and even in a mental institution. It was closer to November. We rented affordable rooms in a small hotel in Paris. We were considering our next steps. We had enough money to carry us through for two more weeks. Russian impresario Sergei Diagolev must have heard about our stay in Paris. So, a telegram inviting us to visit him came in the nick of time. That marked the beginning of stage two of my life. Diaghilev asked me to become Balanchine because he was having a hard time pronouncing my Georgian last name. That day, I became known to the world of ballet under this name. It was at that time that I came up with my artistic credo, see the music, hear the dance. In two months during the 1925 season, I choreographed dances for 12 operas, from November to May, we stayed in Monte Carlo. In June, our Paris season started, followed by a two-week London tour. Then the company enjoyed two months of summer vacation. Next was winter and again Monte Carlo. During a rehearsal in early 1927, I suffered a serious knee injury. After surgery, I quit dancing, which left me only with my choreography, which, thank God, the audience loved. In Europe, I had the honor and joy of making acquaintance of great Russian composer Igor Stravinsky, who became my best friend. I choreographed many ballets to Stravinsky's music. His Apollo aroused in me incredible emotions and inspired me to visualize it. If I could compose music, I would make it sound exactly the same. Apollo, conducted by Stravinsky himself, premiered at the Theatre Sera Bernhardt in Paris in 1928 to make a remarkable impression on the audience. Stravinsky, usually quite disapproving of other choreographies to his music, seemed happy this time. The dance steps that the dancers did were made up on the dancers at the time. He never came to her with preconceived dance steps. Always the music was first. I know that these ballets are total concepts of Balanchine. The scenery, the music, the dances, the costumes, the colors. It has seen, I mean, all of them, he had these concepts. I was invited to replace uh, one of his dancers, Jacques D'Amboise, in Apollo. And uh, I had just flown in, I had just been told 24 hours earlier. And so I flew to Edinburgh, I met him on the street, and uh, he was extremely nice and pleasant, and uh, I expected to rehearse that very moment because the performance was the next night. And he said, why don't you go home and rest? <laughs> and I said, but tomorrow we have to dance. And he said, well, we can rehearse tomorrow. And I said, I'm not tired, it's only one hour flight. And he said, no, you need rest. And uh, I did the performance that night, Apollo, and it was a big success. And then the next morning, he, he said, now we rehearse. And then he changed the entire thing. 
And if the dancer got sick, he would do a whole other variation for that dancer, change it, because it's a different dancer. The room when Mr. Balanchine was creating, to be in the room with him, it was like being nowhere else on earth. We came knowing that we were working on something very, very special. We, the atmosphere was very rare and sometimes seemed as if he was receiving dictation. It was brilliant, indescribable. If we could not move fast enough, he would become impatient. But everyone understood why. And there was no personal uh, bad feeling, I think, with anyone. He had very high standards, and he, you knew when you were disappointing him, but he never made you feel uh, like he disliked you. He was maybe disappointed in you, but in what you were doing at the moment. But, but he always gave you the feeling that he liked you, was interested in you. He was strong, he was powerful, he was egotistical, but he always was gentle. His speech and actions captivated everyone because he had this enormous charisma. Everyone adored Balanchine as a great and yet quiet person. In rehearsal, and sometimes rehearsals can go wrong, he would say quietly, It'll be better tomorrow. Nothing is done overnight. Good things come to those who wait. He never talked in class. He never spoke. He didn't go, Adin, Dva, Tri, Chitiri. He would go. I wanted to have a certain way of dancing. We came from Russia and we had this technique of feeling the stage. But still with this, I was moving his legs out more and more turnouts and stronger knees, and more turns and bigger jumps. You have to know what they need. You have to know what's lacking. As some people, they have a little more of that and less of this. See, the bodies are different. One acquires a little faster speed, the other one has a little more of elevation. You have to watch everyone separately, see what each one needs. Then he'd say, so what can you do? And you know, he would watch you and he incorporated your gifts into the process. And uh, if you had weaknesses, he sort of would conceal them. I believe that Balanchine memorized and carried with him everything that was good about Russia at that time. In fact, he succeeded in fashioning his own signature style, his unique style, his choreographies to Stravinsky's music for one. It was unimaginable in those days to choreograph to the music of Stravinsky, Shostakovich and others. It was very difficult without counting. But later, as you get used to it, you ask yourself, where have you been all my life? How could I live without it? He was such a genius that he used to say, I can choreograph a ballet featuring counting. And he has done it. I can choreograph a ballet about elephants. Voila! He has staged a ballet about elephants. He could produce a ballet about anything. The last ballet I choreographed for Diaghilev's company was The Prodigal Son by Sergei Prokofiev. The music to this Bible-inspired ballet is modernistic. Diaghilev was very fond of my work. Prokofiev, who attended a rehearsal, threw a screaming fit. This is horrible. I don't like it. Ideally, he wanted the prodigal son's choreography to be something on the lines of Rigoletto. So, no wonder my version drove him to the edge. During that rehearsal, Diaghilev stood up for me, yelling at the composer. You don't know the first thing about ballet. Prokofiev backed off, acquiescingly. Generous in praise of my work, Diaghilev told me, the prodigal son has moved me to tears. My immense gratitude to the great maestro has never diminished, warming the cockles of my heart. Unable to operate after his death, the ballet company disbanded. I was in luck again when manager of the Paris opera, Jacques Rocher, offered me to choreograph a new version of Beethoven's Prometheus and invited me to lead the ballet company as its regular choreographer. I started working on the ballet in late October. In early November, I was diagnosed with severe pneumonia. 
Lifa was the lead in this ballet. He would come to visit me every day and consult me about the show's choreography. My pneumonia led to tuberculosis and I was hospitalized immediately, yet the ballet was already taking shape. It was a very interesting deal. He invited Lifa and offered to choreograph the ballet's finale. Balanchine authorized Lifa to be credited as the entire show's choreographer. In return, Balanchine would be paid the choreographer's honorarium to receive medical treatment in Switzerland. Once discharged from the sanatorium, I arrived in Paris only to find the job previously offered to me already taken. Sergei Lifa had been appointed ballet master of the Paris Opera Ballet. I never regretted the way it turned out. I've always lived in the present, never dwelling on the past. Some people are very hard to see through. You must try your best to understand what's on their mind. Balanchine, however, was very straightforward, transparent. He was extremely musical. His ballets would turn simple moves into magical moves. His dancers were the most musical. I remember them coming to work for me and exhibiting excellent fast learning skills, thanks to their unique sense of rhythm and musicality. In October 1931, director of the Monte Carlo Ballet, René Blum, invited me as ballet master for his newly established company, financed by the Royal House of Monte Carlo. I took the job with enthusiasm. We staged several new pieces and offered the audience a new repertoire. High society was ecstatic. Everything would have been well had it not been for the devious intrigues of the theater's second director, who blatantly interfered with artistic affairs. It was absolutely unacceptable to me, and I even had an argument with him. As the tension between us escalated, I was laid off. Mr. Palanchine was something different to everyone. He was my, my father, my brother, my husband, my mother, my sister. He was my life. I'm sure he wasn't that way with a lot of people, but I've always, since knowing him, and even since he's died, it always amazes me how the people who knew him or came across him in life all have a completely different impression, but the respect and the love is always there. Notwithstanding my enormous desire, I never summoned up the courage to ask him to admit me into his school. I met him for the first time here in Monaco. I open the door and see Balanchine in front of me. I was so dumbfounded I didn't even know in what language to speak to him. His company was touring Monaco. He came to me and generously offered his advice, which I will never forget. Then he invited one of his ballerinas to the hotel to demonstrate his own point technique. I will never forget that lesson on the rug. He made an all-out effort to sustain his art. As a person, he was very open to diversity in the world. I had an opportunity to dedicate an entire season to my own vision of the art of ballet. I established Le Ballet of 1933, an experimental ballet company. Unfortunately, this venture proved a short-lived failure. It was met with uninspiring reviews in Paris and as few as 20 performances were held in London. It was in London that I met with Lincoln Kerstein, a wealthy young American impresario. Balanchine had a greater impact on America than America on Balanchine. Before his arrival, there were no significant promising ballets. He was like fresh blood breathing new life into America and making a difference. I was enchanted with New York. I liked America better than Europe. The longest and the most exciting period of my career had just begun. I started from scratch. At first, we established a ballet school, followed by a small company called American Ballet. From 1935 to 1938, we worked at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. I strongly believed in success, which came only after 10 years of hard work. 
when rave reviews were published and the Ford Foundation awarded us a multi-million dollar grant. My picture appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Americans affectionately dubbed me Mr. B. What mattered most, however, was the packed concert venues. I was styled as the torchbearer of American ballet and one of the leaders of neoclassical arts. Balanchine ushered in neoclassicism. I don't think it was his goal in the first place. Stylistically, he just tried to think outside the box. The main direction of his work stemmed from Russian ballet, but he was in constant search of new forms, experimenting a lot. Balanchine's school of choreography made me look at classical ballet in a different light. I realized that classical ballet could be different, not just the way I was used to, Petipas dancing, for example, that some moves could be done in reverse and still look beautiful. You may lose your balance while on point, but that may also be part of the choreography, not an accident. What is modern ballet today? I believe that all types of today's ballet come from Balanchine. He was a great man and the most important figure, uh, I believe, artist of this last century. Why? Picasso could buy his paint, he could buy his canvas. Balanchine had to train his instruments. He had to take children and help them how to dance and teach them. He had to create the medium that he used to make his art. And he was interrelated with it emotionally, totally. What I regret most in my life is not having met Balanchine in person. I met him in my dreams, not in this life though. In 1964, New York City Ballet relocated to the New York State Theatre, part of the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts. We stayed there for 16 years, making our dream come true. We established a company with its American school to raise youth who eventually matured as remarkable dancers. One of Balanchine's dancers performed very well once. Balanchine approached her, gently stroked her cheek, saying in Georgian, Sheni Chirime, a Georgian expression of affection and praise. Balanchine was an Epicurean. I discovered this gourmet restaurant for him where they served white mushrooms. On his next visit, he told me, we will only go to the restaurant that cooks white mushrooms. He was especially fond of the festive Easter Supra table. He would invite his friends and treat them to Georgian dishes stacked up on the table. Then he would sit at the piano and play to accompany dancing ballerinas. He loved to repair things, such as cupboards, old knick-knacks and others. One of Balanchine's photos features him standing proudly next to a wardrobe he had fixed. He was very attentive. He would not pass anyone by without a greeting. If you looked familiar, he could stop you in the street. One young man told me a story. He was just another student, and Balanchine could have caught a glimpse of him. Later, Balanchine noticed him among the crowd in the street, so he stopped to converse with the young man, to tell him his stories and give him advice. The young man was at a loss, embarrassed because Balanchine himself was dedicated so much of his time to him. Balanchine did it simply because that young man appeared at some point somewhere at the back of the stage. He wanted to be in on every detail, including poster inscriptions, costumes, his ballerina's stage clothes and so on. He constantly made changes to all new costumes and everyone loved his modifications. He was a man of taste and friendly disposition. He was head and shoulders above others, not in stature but in character. He was very attentive. He was short and he was always dressed very nicely. He had a love to wear. And he had a bracelet that Maria Tallchief had given him, which was a Native American Indian jewelry that he loved and wore. He always smelt well. He always had cologne, right? Always was clean and neat. 
He became godlike to us. Uh, he was our hero. And I, I know I speak for many dancers and not just myself. When he taught class, he would teach in almost parables. We're not only good for ballet teaching, they were good for life. I think by having Mr. Balanchine in my life, I am what I am today. I, I would be very different had I not had the opportunity of being around him as he was creating. When Bart was here, I introduced him to Gogitishvili's class, little students. We held a class of Georgian dance especially for Bart. The children's dancing was marvelous, with usual demi-plies in the beginning. Then they switched to other moves, and some looked familiar to Bart. And I was amazed to see in those movements some of Mr. Balanchine's rhythms and literal port bras uh, it, it, it was like a, a light going on. <laughs> and uh, I had no idea before, but he comes from a wonderful, rich, beautiful culture, and it definitely influenced his creativity and his art. If he felt that you were going off in the wrong direction, he would give you suggestions, don't do this, or give an analogy, be like a, an eagle. He loved analogies with animals, a cat, an elephant. There were all sorts that he used. And I think through that, he gave us images, and also through his own demonstration sometimes. It was of enormous importance that a brilliant choreographer like George Balanchine came to visit Georgia for the first time. And he was Georgian, Balanchivadze. By the way, Balanchine wanted to establish an opera house here in Georgia. His only wish was to name it after his father, Melaton Balanchivadze. Of course, Moscow would not let him. Even though I am Georgian, I didn't get to Tiflis until 1962. <laughs> A multitude gathered at the airport, my father among them. First, the company exits down the steps of the plane, and finally Balanchine, like a captain. Halfway down the stairs, he noticed my father in the crowd and yelled, Andrusha! It was a very touching moment when they embraced each other. I had waited many years for that moment. Georgi came to the Soviet Union for the first time in 1962. I was very anxious. After all, we, as fate would have it, were separated all our adult lives. But that did not diminish our feelings, of course. Sometimes it seems to me that we were always running toward each other without shortening the distance. In 1962, Balanchine was in excellent shape, a man of ascetic appearance and the stature of a ballet dancer. Father took him to Melaton's grave in Kutaisi. He always respected his country and where he came from. He had a habit of making a point of addressing everyone dear, the same as Georgian Genatsvale. He must have translated this phrase from Georgian and used it to address everyone around. Kikaleshvili made friends with Balanchine. Although Kikaleshvili was past his prime at that time, about to retire, he still had a perfect body for modern dance. 
So Balanchin invited him to join his company for as long as he pleased. Instead, Kikeleishvili suggested hiring his young niece, but Balanchin refused, saying that he did not want to insult his brother's family. There must have been something to it, otherwise he would not say that. Mr. B would say that he did not like celebrities. What he meant was that everyone in his company was such a high-class performer that each was a celebrity in his or her own right. He didn't discriminate. How can one say that there were no celebrities in his company? Who can say that Vilela, Mitchell or Suzanne Farrell was not a celebrity? He never expressed it explicitly because his choreography was sophisticated enough to allow him to pick any dancer from the company and have her dance a lead role. He always cherry-picked unique dancers. Balanchine loved ballet, loved women, and he devoted his life to expressing this through choreography, theatre, ballets. He married many times and had many women that were always his muses, and I think he was always honest and true to all of them. I believe that his muses were celestial, not earthly. In loving beauty and seeing beauty in love, I took after my father. What can be more beautiful than a woman and music? And dance bring the two together. Love is an essential part of human life especially in the latter part of one's life. In later years, it seems to me that art can wait, but a woman cannot. You think you know a thing or two about the arts, but you will never grasp the gist of a woman. His brother Andrea asked him once why he divorced his wife so frequently. He replied, I have never divorced anyone. They are the ones who leave me. Suzanne Farrell was his last muse and flame and the inspiration of his later years. Similarly, he wanted her to portray Dulcinea, who was in turn the muse of Don Quixote. Balanchine's fans, who have seen him perform, truly appreciate him as Don Quixote. Balanchine seems to wrap with bodily form that which is audible, rendering it visible to the eye. All this so perfectly harmonizes with music that it really seems visible. In his choreography, Tchaikovsky sounds totally different. Tchaikovsky's rhythm is heard and seen in a brand new light. His relationship with Rachmaninoff failed. Balanchine was young when he decided to choreograph a ballet to Rachmaninoff's music. The composer became very angry with him, saying that no ballet could be put to his music. So they parted ways, never even trying to make it work thereafter. Georgi Balanchivadze is the greatest figure in the history of ballet. I remember his first and second visit. I was little at the time. It was like a fairy tale, a man coming from America after a long absence. It drew everyone's attention, including mine. A few years ago, I learned from musicologist Nona Lomidza that he had composed music too, and it was her who I got the musical notes from. Seven lyrical romance pieces to English lyrics. I arranged their piano versions without curtailing the originals. So these are not concert hall versions. We may call it Balanchine's music for the piano. Now I will play a piece called Rose's Tango. It seems to me, along with many others, that the notes leap out of sheet music and start dancing. That is the impression one gets when watching his ballets. A description of Balanchine is a musician who choreographed. 
The fact that he was a musician helped, I believe, tremendously. You know, he read a score, he played the piano. You know, it obviously is an added benefit when you're a choreographer. I remember once he told me to choreograph a ballet to Carl Nielsen's music called Little Sweet. And he said to me, there's no piano score. There's only an orchestral score. I will make one for you. And then a week later, he handed me a piano score that he himself had written out from the orchestral score. It was very interesting. And there he was, he was very proud of it, that he was actually able to do that. Andris Lieper and I were the first Soviet dancers to be invited by New York City Ballet to perform Balanchine's choreography. It was a big risk for both of us. It was equally risky for our inviter, Peter Martins, because something like that was happening for the first time. Every time we were rehearsing or actually performing, we were constantly reminded by our hosts that So I had this feeling that the door would open any minute and Mr. B would walk in to have the final say. When I do a ballet, I don't think about happiness or sadness. I think about the composer and his music. I can't cry over the prodigal son or Orpheus because they've gotten themselves into a mess. I have enough problems with the music. It's very hard to come up with movements that don't contradict the music that suits it. That's our whole art, and it's difficult. You have to think a lot about it. There are general rules to the arts, but there are no laws. You must be conscious of the rules, but you can break the laws. The only thing I dislike is that he is rumoured not to have been fond of laughing, which I believe to be untrue. What he did shun was fake facial expressions, not laughter as such. He detested uncalled-for laughter. But he never said not to relate to what you're dancing. As Suzanne Farrell explained to me, he always instructed dancers to listen to music inwardly, not just liking it and hopping and jumping to it, but listening to it inwardly and dancing to it inwardly. That makes a tremendous difference. His every ballet features a plot in the sense that not every gesture reads explicitly, I love you, but every move does express something or someone, or even the music. One may think that these ballets carry no meaning, yet on the contrary, they are rich in meaning and significance. Balanchine was a narrator choreographer. He indeed uh, created a whole new language for dancers for dancers how to dance that you hadn't, that nobody had seen before. How do you perceive a rose? He would ask. What is its purpose? What plot does it convey? Then he would say, a rose has no plot, but it does have a smell and it looks gorgeous and so do my ballets. He would be told that his ballets featured excellent mastery, but had no soul. He would reply, you say soul, but do you believe in God? His spiritual father was Father Andrew, who stayed with him to the very end. They were best friends. Father Andrew said that Balanchine was very religious. He always wore a cross, which Father Andrew kept after his death. Religion is primarily faith, and people today are used to treating everything skeptically mockingly. That cannot be. You can't come to faith suddenly, just out of the blue. You have to achieve faith from childhood. You have to enter it gradually, like going into the ocean. His attitude toward the spiritual world is visible to the naked eye. His ballets frequently feature the other world and the theme of death. Apparently, he finds this other world beautiful and inviting. He carried this theme within him all his life. Despite his great sense of humor, his ballets are very sad. When you are not alone, you think that you would be better off alone. Once you are alone, however, sadness, enormous sadness engulfs you. Why does this happen? I do not know. You picture yourself surrounded by your loved ones, whose company you have long craved. Sometimes you converse with them in your mind, 
and they seem to understand and respond. But then you realize that they are not there. I think that he was a window into the future and he brought ballet from the past up to present time and forward and it's something very difficult to do. So he vastly increased the repertory of ballet. It's hard to believe when you watch all his different pieces that these came from one person that it, it is so such a vast creativity and it is like a Mozart or a Beethoven. I became a principal dancer at 17 and then I, I danced with him until he died and I stayed one more year because I had promised and then I stopped because the red had gone out of the blood. It was uh, sad for me to be there without him. He didn't just die, he, he left me a whole life. And I'm still here, and I, I still work for him in the sense of giving him his ballets. Sometimes he complained about his health. He would say, I can see the image of my father comforting me. I believe that Balanchine was the genius choreographer of the 20th century and he will remain an equally brilliant choreographer in the 21st century. And I hope that he will continue living in the 22nd century. I believe that ballet was first about Petipa and Balanchine, and then everyone else. I don't like describing things in words. I prefer to show them if possible. I'm looking forward to seeing you next Sunday at 7 p.m.